Uh, we are very happy to have you here, Jill. And uh, thanks again. Um, and yes, I'll just hand over to you. Thank you very much, Marcy. Um, I guess in exactly the way that Leah said, um, this is one of the plus sides of um, the, the devastation of the pandemic that we can be in a Zoom room together, despite the fact that I can't see all of you, but it is great to be with you today. Um, I think there's another reason that this is my participation in this seminar series is quite unusual, and that is because I think it's quite rare for sociologists to think that psychologists might have something to say. Um, and the dialogue between our disciplines is, in fact, quite um, interrupted. Um, and that's not without good reason. I think that the tendency from my discipline side to psychologize or reduce social problems to individual experience um, is, um, of course, a limitation. But I do think that if we can talk across disciplines in this way, like we're going to do a little bit of today, that it can be beneficial um, in ways that we can't foresee, that there might be something that I say today that would have a kind of trigger connection um, to something that you are working on that may be quite distant from my focus. So I um, have on the screen an image of the research project that I am working on at the moment with my colleague, Professor Peterson. Um, Begazis with Peterson is a professor of African literature. So I am in this space working interdisciplinary and across multiple different contexts. Um, and the NEST project, Narrative Inquiry for Social Transformation, shows the kinds of ways in which we're trying to think about narrative in relation to lived experience, um, crossing the worlds of individuals and psychological kinds of spaces, but also um, in relation to the wider social, political kind of terrain in which we live. So um, I also wanted to just mention, as, as Marcy has said, that um, the book that I've just um, brought out with Rutledge, um, which is called Narrative Psychology and Vygotskyan Dialogue, um, the subtitle of the book is, in fact, the title of my talk today. And I suppose you could say this is a way of me getting my revenge on the publishers because this is really what I think the book's about. It's about changing subjects, um, and that's the primary title rather than the um, title that they gave, which is, in fact, the subtitle. Um, the subject in um, this, um, this kind of framing of my engagement is, um, is a kind of like um, ambiguous play on the word subject. So the first thing, of course, is that the subject of psychology, the discipline of psychology, um, is focused on the human subject as its object of study or of interest. Secondly, we use this term, the subject, to indicate the grammatical subject in linguistic terms, um, the one who acts, if you like. But of course, we also talk about the subject as she who is subject to or subjugated by um, social processes, the actions of others, and um, our kind of like place in history and in space. So I'm going to talk about this notion of the subject as uh, characterized by three primary um, kind of threads, if you like, relationality, temporality, and embodiment. And in the book, I use the theory of Vygotsky or social historical or social cultural notions of consciousness in relation to narrative psychology to explore these kinds of dimensions of being. But for the purposes of today, I'm going to, in fact, um, foreground or highlight another interlocutor in the book, um, and that is um, a remarkable South African psychologist by the name of Chabani Mangani, 
um, who in the 70s kind of preempted what is now the field of narrative psychology, um, working under apartheid in particular sorts of conditions that I'll try and speak a little bit about today, um, in which he embarked on work, um, which I, not necessarily he, um, understand as a kind of narrative psychology. So in the early 70s, um, 1973 in fact, he brought out this seminal book, Being Black in the World, um, in which he traced and thought about um, what it means to be a black person in the social world. Um, and obviously his theorizing comes from that particular place um, and he elaborates the notion of being black in the world from um, his position um, in apartheid society. He did something quite remarkable in addition to thinking about social life, individual human experience, um, in the conditions in which we were living, which are in fact not that different from the conditions that in which we are living. Um, but he, he undertook a, a series of biographic studies um, or narrative studies, and his choice of subjects was really interesting and, and gives us a particular kind of angle in on these questions. He, um, his work covers um, a range, and I've given you three here who are the prominent and important um, biographies that Mangani wrote um, of artists. So Sokoto and Dumila Feni, both um, visual artists, Feni in particular a sculptor. Um, Sokoto, who I think is relatively well known internationally, Feni less so, um, a painter who in fact lived most of his um, working life in exile in Paris. Um, all of these artists, including um, Ezekiel and Patlela, who's the third, um, the focus of the third um, book that's on your screen, is um, is also um, so his his literature um, was also written primarily from exile. So three um, key figures in which um, that give kind of Mangani a kind of space in which to think about the condition of being black in the world. But he uses these kind of um, eminent artists to explore um, the ways in which we narrate or create meaning about our lives um, in a way that's of course exceptional for, um, for artists, but in fact is um, standard practice for all of us. Um, so he is thinking about um, the nar narration of life um, in which we can think about, first of all, what it firstly does for us is to shift us out of the present to acknowledge the temporality of our experience. That the past, the present and the future is in, in multiple kinds of colliding ways, part of what make us who we are. So from narrative psychology, we have um, this notion from Mark Freeman of the narrative unconscious, um, which I think is similar to another notion that may be more familiar to sociologists, and that's Frederick Jameson's notion of the political unconscious. And so it's much more like that than the Freudian uh, kind of classical unconscious that often comes to mind when we use this word. Um, so the insertion in a narrative framing of, of human experience of the ways in which the past lives on in the present through intergenerational life. So in this, what this does is it connects the personal and political across generations. Now, of course, in um, societies like South Africa and indeed Ireland, um, the, where conflicts are very, very recent, the notion that traumatic history might play itself out in the present is um, kind of, in many ways, seems kind of obvious. But I think that the, the events of this last year 
um, have made it clear how the violent histories of colonialism and genocides across the globe are interwoven in these more recent, recent histories where we can like specify particular liberation struggles or the advent of what we are sometimes called post-conflict societies. So I love this phrase from William Faulkner that the past is never dead, not even past. And we can feel the, the kind of liveness of history in the present. For me, the experience of the pandemic has been instructive, both as a rupture and a strengthening of the narrative lines of history. But it also disrupts and troubles our engagements in the present and stretches us, sometimes feels beyond our capacity to imagine the future. So, so history in this sense, or the temporal no notion of narrative experience, is not only about the past, but also about the future. So the discipline of psychology is quite obsessed with possibilities of predicting behavior or thinking about development as lines that travel forward in time. But this is not the notion of the future that I want us to reflect on, but rather the idea that the possibilities for what could be um, need to be part of our life in the present. So Molly Andrews has written about this concept of the narrative imagination in which the, the, the present and the real intersect with what was in the sense of memory, but also with what could be or is not yet the future. So I think that um, one of the difficulties with this notion of the narrative imagination that we are experiencing, I think all of us in different ways at the moment, is this problem of not the imagination, but rather its failure. The sense that um, we find it hard to imagine what the future might look like. Except when we, of course, collapse into a sort of um, what I think are pitfalls in the imagination um, and in the conceptualization of time. And those are firstly that we conceptualize futures as linear and progressive, continuous with what we are experiencing. And secondly, we often have a failure to imagine different possibilities. Um, and this is kind of manifest in this peculiarly pathological desire for things to return to normal. Um, in the sense that what was is kind of can be reconstituted in advance of where we are at. So narrative time doesn't really work like this and neither in fact does um, space time. So um, the, I love this idea of the wormhole or the way in which we may be able to warp time and travel backwards and forwards in time. We can do this in narratives, but we can't, of course, do it um, in physical or biological life. Um, so we have this kind of like uh, tension between the movement back and forth in history and in possibilities for the future of the imagination. Um, and then the, the necessity for us to continue to live forward. So Kierkegaard kind of like points to this um, tension or kind of conundrum in human life um, that we can only understand things backwards, but we must live forwards. We must continue to live forwards. So Toni Morrison has this to say, and she said this, of course, before the pandemic, before she died. Um, and she was exploring this kind of sense of dislocation and disruption um, and the sense that time is taking different shapes. And she says that it seems that time has no future. It no longer seems to be an endless stream through which the human species moves with confidence in its own increasing consequence and value. It certainly seems not to have a future that equals the length or breadth or sweep or even the fascination of the past. So indeed, the sense of kind of um, of time not flowing in an even way, and also this notion that what lies before us um, 
is increasingly a sense um, of being truncated in, in various ways. Um, and we really are needing to kind of think imaginatively about what alternatives might look like. So Mangani theorizes subjectivity in this way as constituted in time and space, constrained by context and history, but activated and articulated in relation to anticipated futures. So he, he, he says that each individual should be free to constitute his lived experience on the basis of an open appeal to time. An individual has potential. Time appeals to this potential to be realized freely. Such potential may only be realized in freedom, in security. In the absence of freedom and security, planning becomes essentially meaningless or projections into the future. And the individual life becomes provisional or another word that is kind of very kind of topical at the moment, precarious. Okay. So in addition to this notion of time, I want us to think about um, a narrative conception of the subject as relational. Um, this second theoretical thread, of course, is, is linked to the notion of time, that if we understand the past and the future as connected with the present, it makes it possible for us to think of individual lives as part of something much bigger. This image um, of the marigold beads from Zimbabwe um, suggests this kind of fluidity of connection. Um, the movement and the fluidity of individual beads but connected to something larger. Um, and this idea that the formation of human consciousness occurs through others, parents, extended family members, grandparents, and indeed, earlier ancestors, teachers, age cohorts, who link us all into intergenerational social patterns. Mangani's psychology includes a central role, not only for human others, but also for the objects of material culture, emphasizing their use, though, in the living processes of relational communal practices. And again, these beads are suggestive of this. These beads are um, designed and um, created in a contemporary workspace in which um, the Barbian um, bead workers are reinterpreting history and tradition in new and fluid contemporary ways. So um, his argument is, is that the meanings of others through history are inscribed in, in the objects and of course in texts. Um, but the, the way in which we use these objects and texts needs to be in relation with others in a living relationship. This is very, very different to the notions of consumerism or the gathering of objects which are dead in the world. And it much more has a feeling of what Gadamer called the flows of tradition, where the meanings of historical others are inscribed in practices, material objects, and of course in language, and that that is a living process whereby each individual person comes to be the self. Um, so I wanted to just um, talk a little bit about what this does in terms of the notion of the person or the notion of this thing that in psychology we often call the individual. So so um, Mangani's idea is that this binary that we use for thinking about the self and the other, or if you want to use the other terms, individual and the social, the internal, the external, or maybe even agency and structure, that this way of structuring our thinking and our talk and our understanding um, is problematic. And that it is much more helpful for us to think about the connections between these oppositions um, to formulate or think about um, who we are in the world in a very different sort of way. 
So here I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of Ubuntu, which I think has also traveled fairly widely and may be at least a little familiar to some people in the seminar. The concept of Ubuntu is typically asserted as a kind of antidote to individualism, for which we mean selfishness. And this is indeed something that characterizes Western systems of thought and social organization. So usually Ubuntu is put up as a kind of opposition to this notion of the individual um, who is in competitive kind of isolation from others in the social world and um, that kind of independence and um, uh, competitiveness, individualism, sometimes meaning kind of idiosyncratic kind of um, force of personality is um, thought of as the most productive and positive and um, admirable way to be in the world. So what Ubuntu does is it displaces this and replaces this enlightenment subject with an idea that we are never com uh, complete without one another. And in this formulation, Ubuntu offers us an ethical alternative that is communal or collective. And it stresses the preservation or restoration of relationships between people as essential to our humanity. And I think that this is an incredibly important and valuable resource for us to try and think about how we might be able to organize the world differently. But I think that the conceptual strength of the concept um, in defining humanity relationally um, is, is more than simply a reflection on what might be possible when these relations are positive and humane. This idea that I am who I am because of you, um, the notion of Ubuntu, is, uh, captures something about dialectical processes of our relationships with each other um, that, that, that continues, whether these relations are good or bad, whether they are relations of beauty and or terror, whether they are relations of competition or collaboration. So our actions towards others impact not only on their lives, but on ours too. Selves are formed relationally, reciprocally and reflexively. The implications for psychology is that our unit of analysis cannot be the abstract individual, even when the persons that interest us may in fact be culturally individualistic. This notion of the human and this individual person is indeed relationally formed and sustained. So I'm suggesting that even when we are alone, we are so in relation to others. So a failure to imagine the other or a failure to understand the widening stretches of this thing that Benedict Anderson called the imagined community, the life of the other, a failure to understand another as in some ways like me and in other ways different to me, that that's the kind of possibility, the range of possibility and impossibility um, in terms of forming new kinds of social relations. So I'm again talking about failure of imagination rather than its power. Um, and that might be something to do with where we're at um, in the world um, in this time and place. So the third um, thread, the final thread that I want to talk about today is to connect narrative psychology to the body. Now, this again is one of those binaries that we often work with, that there's the body or the material world and then on the other side, there is the symbolic or narrative, language, meaning making, the social. So what narrative psychology can allow us to do, and again, I'm gonna draw very strongly on Manganya here, is to think um, in a much more intertwined kind of way, 
to this um, quote that I have on the screen from Brian Fay, where he speaks about the fact that stories are in our lives and our stories are in our life. So our, our lives are in storied. As we live our lives in the ordinary flow of everyday life, stories are woven into our doing and thinking and being. And the stories that we tell are in lived or enacted um, in relation to others and in our heads. So the narratives that we tell are embedded in and articulate the social world and create these kind of connections that I was talking about earlier between the past and the present and the future, create relationships in cultural networks of those who are close to us in family circles, but also to those who are far from us in swirling global discourses. But we live these stories in and through our bodies. This is a kind of glance towards Vygotsky for those of you who know him. There is nothing more natural than language, than storytelling and narratives. These stories, these narratives, the possibility of language comes from our human bodies, but also have material effects. And these material effects may indeed and very often are oppressive and violent, but they may also be agentic and potentially transformative. Our stories are in the world, as Faye says. Our lives are in storied and our stories are in lived. Now, Angani's context, um, in which he developed his psychology is not incidental to the way in which the body plays such a very large role um, in his work. Um, and this, I think, may, may kind of sound um, not so dramatic, um, given that we live post the kind of turn to affect or the turn to embodiment. But um, at the time at which he began working, um, this idea of the body and narrative were indeed considered quite dis disparate and different kinds of phenomena. So how is it that a person who does his work through the method of biography, does his work through narrating experience and thinks about the psyche um, in these terms um, is actually also grounding this um, idea of narrative in the body. So in his 2016 memoir, Becoming a Black Psychologist Under Apartheid, um, Mangani describes how he was barred from established sites for what is called supervised internships on the grounds of his race. Under apartheid, it would have been unthinkable for a black intern psychologist to attend to white clients and their troubles. And no psychological services were provided for black people. Instead, he was therefore assigned to work in the neurology ward in a public hospital. So by virtue of his black body, Mangani was turned away from conventional psychological practices and theories to focus on the brain and somatic processes of psychic life. In this way, his thinking is informed on the one hand by the politics of discursive constructions of the race body, his own and those of others, and on the other by his focus on a substratum of natural physical processes through which minds work. So it's quite a unique and um, very fortuitous kind of mixing of these two kind of frames for thinking. I think the idea that the biological domain is that is is like fully determined and untouched by meaning has indeed been well upended. Bodies mutate and can be subjected to artificial manipulations of all kinds. Everyday practices constantly alter our natural bodies, shaving, dyeing, straightening or curling hair, makeup, perfuming, and the tattooing and piercing of skin. Medical, medical technologies enable pacemakers to do the work of bleeding hearts. Some of us can move about on prosthetic limbs that are able to respond to electronic stimulation of the brain. Implants can change our sexy curves. 
and gender reassignment surgery can rename us and change our social relations in dramatic ways. Bodies are interpreted and crafted, but nonetheless, they are pivotal in the making of meaning and exceed our control of this meaning making and insert us into the material world of objects and other people. So the mutability of the body is not infinite. They can grow fatter or thinner, fitter or creakier, but always older, never younger. The temporality of the body is different to the temporal fluidity of narrative meaning making that we discussed earlier. We are embodied meaning making creatures. And here I'm going to give you a quote from a really wonderful novelist, Suri Hustabet. He says it like this. Human beings are animals with hearts and livers and bones and brains and genitals. We yearn and lust, feel hunger and cold are still born from a woman's body and we all die. These natural realities are inevitably framed and understood through the culture we live in. If each of us has a narrative, conscious and unconscious, a narrative that begins in the pre-verbal rhythms and patterns of our early lives, that cannot be extricated from other people, those to whom we are attached. People who are part of shaping essential muscular emotional rhythms that lie beneath what has become fully articulated narratives intended to describe symbolically the arc of a singular existence and then each of us has already been bound up in the world of others so because of our embodiment we are connected to others and she of course explores this particularly in relation to female bodies but the the idea that who we say we are in the world, our identities, our narratives of experience um, are, are only possible and only make sense in our embodied existence. The boundaries of the material and symbolic, social and psychological, or nature-nurture collapse. So of course we're all post-structuralists and we know that words and worlds are severed there's no transparent direct representation of reality, but narrative remains entangled with embodied life. In as much as there is no solely sensory connection with the world, neither is there a hermetically sealed domain of words, storytelling or even theory making that has no bearing on embodied lives. According to Mangani, the relational quality of human life entails being in relation to first and foremost one's own body as an existential fact. And the significance of this fact in both sociological and psychological terms. The body is not merely an inert substrate, rather it constitutes an individual's anchor in the world. It is the physical body which makes it possible for an individual to be given a name, to tell all and sundry who he is, to constitute lived space. In other words, it's only through the body that our social relationality is possible, particularly through communal networks of family, kin, and geographical neighborhoods, and indeed across these ethereal kinds of spaces. So the swirling experiences of the pandemic for me foreground these connections, both common because the virus like human bodies is biological, but also highly differentiated because of how human action and thought has organized the material world in such extremely unequal ways. Again, Mangani, the body is the nexus of all the fundamental relations dialogue and exchange between people, which an individual person develops with others, with objects and with space and time. If the integrity of the body is violated, it has been as it has been in the case of black people, the other existential relationships also become distorted. Creating what he calls unhygienic conditions for human life. So this idea of the unhygienic, of course, in the context where we are all aware that we may 
be infected by others or infect others, um, the, that seems very kind of concrete and, and obvious. But he is referring here to the notion of, of conditions being unwell in a psychological sense, that the conditions of shelter, of safety, of crowding, of alienation, the possibilities for being at home, of being exiled, of being um, vulnerable to illness and even to death. Um, these conditions of the body are also conditions of psychological and social life. So I'm going to, I'm starting to come to a close now, and I want to just talk a little bit about this idea of vulnerability to illness and death, because of course, this is something that we wish we could control, and the kind of resistance to our mortalness, um, to the possibilities of danger in the physical body. Um, so now I'm jumping continents and spaces, and also again disciplinary kind of framings, um, to draw on um, a text that I've recently read and find really quite provocative and interesting. And this is from a Swedish philosopher by the name of Martin Hufland. And he says that in fact, this idea that mortality is the thing that truncates our experience um, misses the point. He says the goal is not to overcome finitude, but to transform qualitatively our ability to live free lives. Even in their most ideal state, our lives will have to reckon with the risk of finitude, the risks of losing what we love and losing our ability to do what we love since these risks are inherent to freedom itself. So I think that um, this idea that, that human bodies are vulnerable and that the project of life, um, of making a meaningful life, for transforming the conditions of social political life, for attending to traumatic histories, um, both at the individual level and at the structural level, um, this, these commitments and these interests, um, this project of a life, if you like, is a precarious one. And it's partly the notion that it's precarious that um, in, impels us to take care. A commitment to sustain and to care for this life because partly it is finite. Um, and this notion that we are, um, as we make an individual life and as we make communal life, we are living in time towards a future that for us each individually at least is shortened as we live, but also collectively as a species is clearly being shortened as we live. Um, and to live in relationship with others requires care, and attention to the versions of the world that we want to tell um, in our narratives. I'm going to conclude with a quote from um, the novelist Chinua Achebe, um, who is, of course, famous for, the, well, he's written many wonderful things, but his novel, Things Fall Apart. Um, and Achebe kind of points us to this interweaving of um, the species life the physical human conditions of life and, and narratives in ways that are quite similar, I suppose, to Brian Fay's notion of in storing and in living. So he says this. The universal creative rondo revolves around people and stories. People create stories, create people. Or rather, stories create people, create stories. Was it stories first and then people, or the other way around? Thank you. <laughs>